Hello, I'm Dr. Felix Lorenz from Germany. I am a collaborative scientist of the Paris Museum and a shell dealer since 30 years. I have a long going experience in looking at seashell collections, identifying shells, evaluating collections, and uh, setting up important collections as my uh, former job as a dealer. The Phil Noodleman collection I've been actively contributing to for many years and it always struck me as being a collection that includes all aspect of malacology. It includes a whole, showing a whole variety and, and diversity of the mollusks and this does not mean just the popular families but also the cryptic families, the little known ones, or things that are not very well known as being incredibly rare and, in this case, extinct animals that Phil managed to conserve for science during his collecting activity. I have never seen in all my life a set of Acatinellas from Hawaii like this. But this is just a small example of the uh, richness of this collection and I was mildly surprised to see how well it's curated. See, I don't know of any other privately owned collection in America that has this wealth in different species and this precision in, in the database as yours. Hi, my name is Phil Noodleman. I'm a longtime avid shell collector, and the purpose of this video uh, is to really kind of semi document the collection before it leaves. And when I say before it leaves, it's because any shell collector has some decisions to make later on in life. Uh, I've been collecting for 77 years, and uh, it's my time to make those decisions. I could sell off the collection piece by piece, which I don't want to do. I could give it to the kids, which I'd love to do, except where are they going to put it and what do they really want to do with it and are they interested? Or what I really want to do and what we have decided to do is uh, donate the collection to the Burke Museum of Natural History and Culture at the University of Washington. We decided on the Burke Museum for a lot of reasons. We talked to people from Smithsonian from uh, Field Museum in Chicago that badly wanted this collection uh, to uh, the Museum Natural uh, in uh, Natural History in uh, Paris who wanted the collection, uh, the uh, Santa Barbara uh, Natural History Museum. So it was quite a bit in demand, including the Bishop Museum in Hawaii in Honolulu, but the. One closest to home at the University of Washington is the Burke Museum of Natural History and Culture. It's a beautiful museum, uh, basically looking at the Pacific Rim culture and natural history, but also looking worldwide. They have a small collection, a uh, mollusk collection, but have agreed that if we would donate the Sandra and Phil Noodleman shell collection to them, that that would be the seed for a growing malacological collection. So, starting next week, the Burke Museum uh, curators will be out packing up the shells and our long history with uh, directly owning a shell collection will be at its end. All right, well, we're going to take a tour of the shell collection itself. So in future years, uh, uh, Mitch and Sherry and Mark and Laura and all the grandkids and great-grandkids uh, when we're not around can really uh, take a look, take their own tour of what their shell collection is and their tie to the Burke Museum. Before we go uh, take a tour, uh, I want to talk about a few specific shells that really have a, a meaning to me, an interesting meaning to me. Uh, the first one is really, it doesn't make a lot of difference what the shell is because there are two shells. Here's two shells. One is what they call a spondylus or a spiny oyster. The other one is a shell from a gun, from a 
high uh, velocity rifle. And this is a shell upon a shell. And the interesting part is that it came from the bottom of Pearl Harbor in about 60 or 70 feet of water. It was found by a friend of mine from uh, Honolulu, Chris Takahashi, uh, a young man that I, well, he was a young man when I first met him. He was 18. And we uh, did some diving together, a lot of snorkeling, a lot of shell collecting together. He found this and gave it to me because it had a real significance uh, being from 1942, from the 41-42 uh, era, from uh, Pearl Harbor. One of the most famous shells is the golden cowrie, uh, Cypria aradius. And it's really its fame came from the fact that there were very few found, they were very rare, it's from the South Pacific. It's a very glossy uh, cowrie. All of the cowries are similar in the fact that they do not have crust, uh, incrustations of coral or algae because the mantle of the, sh of the animal itself goes over the top of the shell and that keeps the shell shiny. This shell, probably now you can pick one up uh, from a collector for between $100 and $300. When they first were discovered, they were going for five dollars to $10,000 uh, per shell. Uh, they're much more plentiful now uh, with diving, with deep water diving. This is the golden cowrie, and it's still probably the uh, insignia of uh, shell collectors, or at least novice shell collectors, who are really looking for uniqueness and beauty in shells. This is the shell room made up of a lot of different cabinets, and this side is really mostly cowries, which is the crux of the collection. Um, and what we're talking about in the shell room is roughly 7,000 different species, uh, making up probably 10 to 15,000 specimens. Uh, these are the cowries. And we have um, most of the what are called Cornell boxes or California Academy boxes, which house the shells. We'll take these down and open them up and take a look at not each shell, but just kind of the layout of the shells. Uh, in the cowrie family, uh, these are the talpas, the genus uh, uh, talpa. Uh, really not a lot of different species, basically two. One being the exusta, which is a uh, very uh, relatively rare uh, cowrie. The others are a little more commonplace. Uh, and that's the talpas, the ones you see out here. This is more of the lurias. This one is particularly nice because this is Cypria tessellata, luria tessellata. It's from Hawaii. It's endemic to Hawaii. Uh, they have four spots uh, on the sides, uh, sometimes no spots, and sometimes one spot. So they're variable, but uh, this is a highly sought-after cowrie. Yeah, a related uh, shell to the golden cowrie is probably the most common of all uh, cowries. It's found in most areas of the world in, in uh, tropical uh, oceans, and it's the tiger cowrie, or Cypria tigris. Uh, this is the classic that's available in shell shops and souvenirs uh, and so forth. Uh, you can buy these in a shell shop for anywhere from 50 cents to uh, three, four dollars. But to me, it's a very fascinating shell, a very fascinating cowrie, because of the, the variety of Cypria tigris that are found around the world. For example, if you go to Hawaii, uh, deep diving in Hawaii, you find one of the largest Cypria, one of the largest tiger cowries. This is Cypria tigris shelderiana. Shelderiana is, uh, grows up to about six, uh, six and a half inches. The world record size is about six and a half inches from the anterior to the posterior. <coughs> and these are well thought, uh, sought after. Uh, you can buy I uh, purchased these uh, from a shell collector for three to five hundred dollars each, uh, depending upon the size. If they're over six inches, you're really talking about a lot of money. Uh, in the 
Noodleman collection, there are probably 30 that are over six inches. Uh, and these are really very heavy, magnificent shells. <clears throat> Moving into a different uh, subfamily, uh, the Tronas. Uh, that's this group here. Fairly plain, not overly common, but prized because of their size and coloration. These are a couple more subfamilies of the cowries, uh, the Reviais. Uh, the one I would really pay most attention to is one called Argus. It's a spotted cowrie. Um, it's uh, from Hawaii and other parts of the South Pacific and really is very, very interesting as far as its coloration um, in the spots. Earlier we talked about the golden cowries. Uh, they are prized in collections. Everyone would like to have one golden cowrie. Here's a, a display of some of the better ones in uh, our collection. And, um, there are more. There are others. The coloration of, uh, of the golden cowries varies from the light to the dark, uh, the most prized being the very dark color. All characteristically have the columnar teeth and the teeth which are colored with the same color as the gold of the top. This group of cowries uh, really has quite a few of the rarer group, the broad ripper eyes and the leucodons. The leucodons have very, very large teeth, as you can see. And both the number and the size of the teeth are very important from the taxonomic point of view. This group uh, contains the lynx cowrie. Now, the lynx cowries are very, very common throughout the Philippines. Uh, but the reason these are important to me is that this one and a couple next to it here, I found in Maui uh, in about four feet of water uh, under, a, um, under a large boulder uh, several years ago. They have a bluer coloration than some of the Philippine variety. As we talked about the range extension in the lynx, here's another cowrie that has a range extension. This is the deer cowrie or uh, vitellus. This is a very common cowrie in the uh, South Pacific up as far as uh, the Philippines and Okinawa. But I found two very nice specimens, again, in Maui, off of the Jodo Mission, in about four feet of water. This is a subfamily uh, of uh, Cypria. This is the Cypria Vulas, and they are all South African cowries, all from down at the Cape, all around Port Elizabeth and other parts of South Africa. Uh, very distinctive, relatively rare, and relatively small, as many of the cowries go but very diverse, and uh, uh, collectors really look very, very carefully and very hard to get uh, representatives of this group. Now, for some reason, maybe my love for diversity uh, has got this group, uh, the Cribarulas, to be probably my favorite subgroup of all of the cowries. Uh, they're similar, yet quite different in a lot of different cases. They're found from Australia through the South Pacific and other areas. Here's one that I think is striking. This is from Australia. It's called Cribarula exmouthensis magnifica. And the exmouthensis is from an area called Exmouth in Australia where these are found in very deep water, very rare, very hard to get. This group of small cowries is again very diverse in its coloration. The acellus, uh, the deliculum uh, with the uh, kind of zebra type stripes on it. Um, very, very distinct, very different.
Just to show a little bit about the variations that make shells so exciting, at least to me, so different things make people excited in different ways. Uh, here is an example of a tiger cowrie that looks very similar size-wise to the souvenir type, but is very, very rare in its golden or bronzed coloration, probably caused by some element in the water uh, by where it lives. This is from the South Pacific. Uh, and is a very, very beautiful specimen. On the other hand, you can go to a very different uh, type of tiger cowrie. This is still the classic tiger, but with tremendous uh, coloration. And the line down the center is where the two halves of the mantle come together over the top of the shell. But from the standpoint of, of shells that I really want to keep out of the collection. There are very, very few, but uh, two of these uh, tiger cowries, because of their coloration, really are the ones that I want. They go from the grays, the blues, the yellows, uh, tremendous coloration. So far we've been talking a bit about cowries, uh, and cowries make up the bulk of the Newman collection uh, because they are so showy uh, and they're so diverse. But most of the cowries are what they call recent cowries. Uh, but there are fossil uh, representatives of the cowries. And this one is called uh, Gigantocypria uh, gigas. Gigantocypria is a fossil cowrie about 100 million years old. They are very, very rare. They are very, very large. Uh, the Paris Museum, uh, Museum uh, Natural History in, in Paris, uh, had a couple of these that were donated to them by Dr. Felix Lorenz, the foremost cowrie uh, expert in the world. For, uh, uh, Felix is from Germany, uh, uh, outstanding reservoir of knowledge about cowries. He gave uh, two to the uh, Paris Museum, and he gave one to me uh, years ago. So this one is, is very, very much a favorite of mine. It's very valuable. And uh, this is uh, uh, Gigantocypria gigas, probably the largest of the cowries that anyone will see. This drawer contains the Erocerias, which is one of the largest subgroups. And the interesting part of these are uh, this group here, you've probably seen, there's di there are four different species here, but probably have seen in souvenir shops making lays, uh, shell necklaces, shell lays. Uh, these were originally used in the South Sea Islands uh, for money. These are the so-called money cowries. Uh, Oblovata, there's uh, annulus, uh, the snakehead cowries, uh, various forms of snakehead cowries. Probably the most common of the cowries in the South Pacific is the snakehead. Cypria caput serpentis. This is one you find washed up on the beach or in the rocks at low tide uh, all over the South Pacific. However, they are closely related to ones that look similar, but they're quite different. These are from Easter Island and only from Easter Island. Okay, just as we talked about uh, the golden cowrie being kind of a significant collector's item, this one, which is called Cypria guttata, is also a relatively rare, uh, artificially priced uh, cowrie that every collector strives for. They're still selling for uh, Oh, in the three hundred to four hundred dollar range, but uh, when I say artificially priced, fishermen now have a good idea when they when they uh, find shells in their fishing nets and so forth. They don't release them to the public. They don't sell them to dealers. They hold the price up that way, so it becomes a supply and demand. These were really quite plentiful, but the fishermen in the Philippines and in Thailand just held them back so the price stayed up. Price is starting to come down just a little bit on these. All right, uh, this is a 
um, genus or a subfamily on the genus of the Cypria of the Cowries. It's called Umbilia. There are several different ones. This is probably one of the rare ones, Armeniaca, they call it. They're becoming a little bit more uh, uh, common. Uh, but some of them, even some of the rest of them in here, are, are fairly hard to find. The one with a story is this one. This is, as you can see it here, is Chimeria incomparabilis. This shell, if it was real, would be worth about half a million dollars. There's uh, this one is uh, made in the Philippines out of a common white cowrie and is painted, all hand painted. And the reason I don't have uh, uh, one, one is the cost, the real one was the cost. But secondly, there was a museum, the museum, American Museum of Natural History had one, was having their collection appraised and the shell was missing uh, after the appraisal. So they finally got the appraiser, the guy who appraised it. They uh, put him in jail. They tried him, put him in jail. And then all of a sudden, the uh, islanders in the Philippines decided they would make pseudo ones, false ones. This is one, I think I paid $5 for this. If it was real, it would be worth an awful lot. Earlier we talked about the uh, Cypria tigris Childeriana, which is the form of the tiger cowrie from Hawaii. These are endemic to Hawaii, these large ones. They get to a little over six inches. Uh, they're very valuable over six inches. This one is a tad over. Getting to be harder to find and uh, again, very much in demand. Unique coloration, everyone different, just like a fingerprint. Another one of the rarer cowries. Uh, these are Cypria Valentia. They're right around seven hundred to a thousand dollars a piece uh, for a collector. If in perfect condition, they're worth well, well above that. The next three or four drawers are all of the Cypria Mappa, M A P P A group, and these are these range from the tourist type two dollar cowrie to the really high priced several thousand dollar species and forms and it's all based on coloration and pattern all of the patterns are different and the colors are strikingly different these are very collectible and very different very diverse now in the, in the whole complex of cowries, everyone has their favorites and their favorite group and favorite subfamily, famous genus. This starts the genus Zoila, Z-O-I-L-A, exclusively from Australia, various parts of Australia, and usually fairly deep water. Uh, this group down here is Cypria Rosselli. Uh, the darker they are, the more valuable they are. Here's one that is almost completely black. Also, the Zoila are relatively well known from, uh, from fossil uh, records. And uh, some of the Zoila fossils are very valuable to collectors. But as you can see and will see in the next few, this whole complex of Zoilas is, they're very attractive and therefore people just like to view them or or have them. They're hard to collect because they're relatively deep water. Give you some examples of three different species. And what we've tried to do over the years is upgrade, uh, get a, a poor specimen to start and then Try, uh, trade it up or buy a, a more expensive one, one in better condition, and then trade away uh, the other one until you get really the high quality 
such as this one, such as this one. In fact, all of these are really high quality, high caliber collector uh, shells. Another part of the Zoila complex are Zoila friendi. Friendi comes in a variety of forms and a variety of colors. Here's uh, one that has shades of blue. And I are deep water. They're getting harder and harder to find. And when we say shells are getting harder to find, uh, it is really not because of collectors. Shell collectors, uh, it's kind of a, a intrinsic code where they make sure and return the coral on the bottom the way they found it. Uh, they don't take shells off of eggs if shells are off uh, egg, on eggs. They leave them there. If shells are imperfect, a good collector will leave it in the water and only take the, the fine specimen so the others can reproduce and produce more. But when shells are getting harder and harder to find, it's not because of collectors. It's because of the environment. In Australia, we have the crown of thorn starfish that's destroying the reefs. That's causing issues for many of the cowries and many of the, the mollusks in that area. Uh, in the Philippines, commercial collecting is taking its toll. But I want to emphasize that shell collectors, including myself, are really conservationists. Uh, this is another part of the Zoila complex. Uh, these are all from the Marginata group in all different, um, all different forms and varieties of Marginata. And you can see how they differ. These are very highly collected. collected. Uh, they're very valuable, uh, particularly the gem forms, uh, very hard to find, and uh, extremely, ex as I said, extremely valuable uh, from a price standpoint. Many of the shells in this drawer or these drawers are similar to the ones that were over here, but are of pretty much a uniform size. They're not really duplicates per se. And in many cases, they are what we call freaks. They are deformed uh, shells, which, believe it or not, become very, very valuable um, just because of the size and the, ch the differences that uh, occur in nature and the coloration. You can see the colors of the same. This one is also a freakish one, but Here's another freak from the standpoint of color. Here are more tiger cowries of the Childerianas. Uh, we saw some before. These are the smaller ones. This is a group called Testudinaria. It, it's a relatively uncommon uh, shell from uh, the Philippines, a variety of different sizes um, of the same shell, and some very significantly different coloration. You can see the little white spots, little white dots. That is characteristic of this particular cowrie. More tigers, as you can see. This one might be interesting to show. This is a tiger cowrie. It was washed up on the beach. It is a juvenile. This side over here is the columella, and that part is the latest part of the growing shell, and the teeth are starting to develop. There are no teeth. There are very few over there. Here there are maturing teeth, and the same on the other side. Uh, but this is a juvenile shell, much lighter than this one. 
This is Cypria mauritiana. Mauritiana is a very heavy cowrie. And it's interesting to know that, that the reason it's so heavy is these are found in the surf zone on rocks where the surf is constantly pounding. So they have to be heavy and they have to have a, a lot of hold on those rocks in order to stay on the rocks. They're usually found at night uh, foraging for food and um, they're all vegetarians. Cowries are vegetarians. And some of them are very small. This is an adult. This happens to be a dwarf. These are, what you've seen here, are really representatives of the cowries and the cowrie family. Uh, there are about 760 genus of cowries represented. Uh, they're uh, a variety of forms on most of those or many of those. And these are all going to be at the Burke Museum of Natural History and Culture. There are several different classes of mollusks or types of mollusks, the, the bivalves, the gastropods, the cephalopods, such as the chamber nautilus, uh, which you've got some up here, uh, the, um, uh, the chitons and so forth. All of them have similar but different characteristics related to breeding. Uh, the cowries lay eggs on coral reefs, on, underneath uh, rocks and caves. They're fertilized. The eggs develop into larvae. These larvae are, in some uh, species, free swimming. Uh, they, some of them are pelagic. They go with the, the uh, currents. But they never really get too far from their endemic area. Uh, and that's, uh, that's subject to debate as to why they don't get too far. It could be the minerals in the water. It could be uh, uh, other chemicals in the water. But they usually stay in their, in their uh, endemic habitat. Uh, they, if they're free swimming or floating, they then drop to the bottom and start a process of calcification of a shell. And that's usually done in a spiral. And even though the cowrie does not look like the typical shell from the standpoint of a spiral, as many people are used to. Uh, all of the mollusks the, uh, start with a little protoconch and slowly unwind or slowly build uh, their calcium deposits to become a, a shell with different chambers. Uh, the cowrie, you see the last growth of the cowrie being the largest one. So they're very, uh, all very different, very diverse. Uh, some of the coloration in cowries and in other shells is due to the water in, uh, in the areas where they're found. And some is just due to heredity. Uh, very much in some species, the heredity is uh, paramount and they don't vary hardly at all. Uh, but in some, tremendous variation, both in color, size, form. The, the Noodleman collection of shells encompasses well over 100,000 specimens. Uh, approximately 7,000 of those species are documented, fully cataloged in the computer. Uh, this room contains mostly shells that are documented and cataloged in the computer, but some that are not fully documented, uh, such as the chitons, uh, thousands of chitons of uh, uh, various forms from various parts of the world. And murex, very different coloring. These are all from Hawaii. Mur murex Pele, Pele being the volcano goddess. All the same, all the same species, all the same but different colors. So this entire cabinet um, is full of shells that are cataloged, but perhaps not fully integrated in the collection. These are not cowries. Uh, these are a variety of other families. Another group of shells that really is the, are favorites of collectors are the cone shells. Uh, the cone shells uh, are uh, prevalent throughout the world, but mostly in the tropical areas. Uh, there are cones in some of the uh, cooler waters, but of Southern California and so forth. 
But the cone shells, mainly in the tropical waters, the distinguishing characteristic here is many of the cone shells are very, very toxic, very poisonous. They have a, a what they call, uh, it's like a, an arrow or a barb that comes out. It's a barbed hook. Uh, if you uh, pick up a cone on the beach uh, and put it in your pocket, you find sometimes that you've gotten jabbed by the cone and poisoned. Some of the cones have been known to be fatal, to kill people uh, because of the toxin. Uh, all of these cones that you'll see in the collection uh, are going to the Burke Museum. And another very fascinating part of the Burke Museum is the world expert on cones, Dr. Alan Cohn, K-O-H-N, as opposed to the cone shell, C-O-N-E. Dr. Alan Cohn uh, is the uh, uh, curator of mollusks at the uh, Burke Museum. So Alan Cohn is going to get a lot of cones uh, to uh, talk about. Uh, some of the cones are very expensive, uh, very valuable. Uh, Conus gloria maris is probably the most uh, well-known cone, and uh, uh, there are several in the collection here. This drawer is, is simply an example, uh, holds examples of land shells. Many people think that the land shells are, are just very, very uh, drab and are not very much color, not very much variety, uh, but quite to the contrary. These are examples, uh, only three of which I think I'd point out. One is this group in here, which are the Manus Island uh, tree snails. They're endangered. Uh, they're from the Manus Island in the South Pacific. They are uh, very difficult to get these days. Uh, people do trade them. You can't sell them. Uh, vivid greens and yellows. Uh, beautiful shell and perhaps one of my favorite uh, favorites of all shells. Uh, another group of shells here are the uh, Florida uh, ligueous shells. Great variety of shells uh, of colors of ligueous shells in the hammocks in the Keys of Florida. Uh, with only a s small number of miles apart, you find totally different forms and varieties. And a third group are the Palomitas. Here's a couple here. And another one over here, a large one. Those are Cuban, Cuban land snails. And they're very famous uh, in history. Uh, you see them in National Geographic and a variety of other uh, document documentaries related to shells. Uh, again, hard to find these days. Uh, very, very beautiful color-wise. Another group worthy of mention are the Acantinellas. These are basically extinct. Uh, they are very hard to come by in collections. The, our collection has a very large selection of uh, Acantinellas. These are all from Hawaii. Uh, they are extinct now in Hawaii and are found in the Kulo Mountains and other mountain ranges uh, on Oahu and uh, uh, one or two of the other islands. Uh, again, a very, very rare grouping of land snails. The collection contains a number of pectin shells. Pectins, scallops, clams are bivalves, uh, but the most colorful ones, the, the pectins, uh, two valves, right and the left, variety of colors. The ones in these, this drawer here are all the same species, just different colors, and they can be found side by side. Many of these are Colorful ones are from the tropical areas, but even in the state of Washington, we have several different scallops, pectins, uh, that are quite colorful. The different types of shells or major groupings of shells are the gastropods, the cephalopods, the bivalves. Here are the bivalves, which the bi meaning two, two valves, two separate valves, joined at the bottom by uh, kind of a hairy, a muscle fiber uh, that holds them together. These actually swim, scallops swim by moving back and forth and jetting water out. But the most distinguishing characteristic of the bivalves, there's a right valve and a left valve. Uh, they're very colorful. 
and they vary tremendously within the same species. This one is from Hawaii. It's called Nodopectin Lang 40, and it is very prized for jewelry uh, in uh, the Hawaiian Islands, uh, sometimes called the sunrise shell. But it's a very highly desired collector shell. Now, malacology is a, a science uh, of uh, the study of mollusks. And it is a very exact science, uh, like the rest of uh, all sciences, in that there are official naming rules uh, for every animal, every plant. Uh, animals are named uh, with the old Linnaeus type structure, Carl Linnaeus, who came up with binomial nomenclature, two names, a genus and a species name. And um, the International Commission on Zoological Nomenclature is the official governing body that keeps records of uh, the uh, names of shells, the description, the holotype or the museum that houses the original uh, described uh, species or specimen. <coughs> and uh, there are probably 100,000, a little over 100 or 110,000 different mollusk species. Uh, mollusks uh, making up next to insects one of the most diverse and large groups of animals. In naming um, shells, uh, it's a very specific science. Specific science. There are uh, new shells discovered every day, new animals, new species discovered every day. And it was an extreme honor to have these little shells uh, named uh, Diminovula sandri. Uh, after Sandra Noodleman. And they were named by uh, two malacologists, Felix Lorenz and Derek Fincy. Uh, they were found off of Hergada, Egypt, in very deep, deep water. Uh, they are beautiful little shells with very distinct characteristics. And they are a family called ovulids, which ol uh, the ovulids are very similar to the cowries, but there's enough difference that systematically they are a separate family. So this is uh, Diminovola sandri, and uh, uh, very much an honor to have it named after Sandra. This is the animal that, uh, with the mantle, similar to cowries, that goes over the top of the shell and keeps the shell nice and shiny. The animal itself is colored to blend in with the corals and the algaes and the uh, encrustations uh, on the rocks. Uh, as a protective mechanism. Those little points or papillae are uh, mechanisms for sensing currents, sensing uh, uh, other animals, the presence of other things. Um, again, defensive mechanisms. The Murex group, um, highly variable, not as much in color. They're not a very colorful group, but they are very, very diverse and variable related to form. This whole group here uh, is typical of a, a, a grouping of murex that uh, uh, have very sharp spines, mostly for protection, uh, but you can see how intricate they can be. These are the top shells. They are variable related to color. You have all sorts of different styles and and types, but they all look like a little mountain, a little top. Um, some of them have the operculum, which is kind of the trap door for the shell, for the snail that's inside, is a protective mechanism. Uh, some of them have very hard calcified uh, uh, pieces here that look like cat's eyes, uh, and they are, here's an example. You can see it, they're very hard, like a marble. So the operculum is collected by people uh, besides just the shell. The turbo uh, is uh, related to the top shell. And the turbo has a very hard operculum. Uh, it's like a huge marble. This one is almost like a dinner plate, a small plate. Very hard. Um, look like part of the shell, but really just holds the animal in, inside.
protecting the animal. This is uh, what is commonly called a Triton's trumpet. There's an Atlantic variety, a Pacific variety. They are uh, commonly used in the tourist trade by drilling a hole or breaking off the top here, drilling a hole and using these to blow the trumpet, the Triton's trumpet. It's both this one and the conch, big conch down here uh, that are used for, for uh, uh, that type of activity. But from a collector's standpoint, these are highly variable in size, but very similar in coloration. These are all Triton's trumpets of different uh, species and different forms. They get very large, some of them as big as 36 inches long, uh, and uh, very, very valuable. These are the spiny oysters, um, spondylus. Uh, tremendous diversity in color uh, in this group. These are bivalves, uh, two valves, a right and a left. They are very delicate spines. Uh, they are uh, members of the oyster family or the clam family or the bivalve group. Uh, Again, the characteristic here is color, spines, shape, and they vary all over the world. They vary in size uh, and in coloration. This group of shells are the carrier shells. Uh, this is Sandra's favorite group of shells, and I think they're absolutely fascinating. This is a larger one, uh, is an Ophra uh, longlii. It's uh, from the Atlantic Ocean. And it looks just kind of like a blob that sits on the bottom of the ocean. But the characteristic of the carrier shells is they gather other shells and rocks and things in the vicinity and glue them on themselves to their shells. And you can see the variety. We have a complete, uh, the collection has a complete uh, group of Xenophora shells. In other words, every species that's been discovered we have in this collection. Uh, these are a variety of species of Xenophoras, and you can see that they glue on almost anything that is in the vicinity of where they are. Here's one, in fact, that found a bottle cap and glued it onto its shell. These are not man-made. These are all Xenophora shells. Here's one that lived in a uh, area with simply stones on the bottom and glued stones on to itself. So this is a fascinating group of shells and uh, even though not very colorful, I think in the entire uh, Sandra and Phil Noodleman collection, shell collection, this is one of the most complete groupings and probably one of the most interesting. Now these are examples of a shell called Cyrinx Arontius. It is the world's largest shell, uh, at least the recent world's largest shell. It's from uh, Australia, found only in Australia. Uh, they're, uh, they're huge. Uh, I believe the world record size of Cyrinx is about 40 inches, maybe even a little longer. So it's a huge, huge shell. In the ocean, these are covered by what is called a periostracum which most, uh, most or many shells are, are covered with. And that kind of protects the shell itself uh, by letting algae and corals grow on the, the periostracum. Uh, if you clean that off with Clorox or Purex or whatever, you get this type of clean shell. This is not polished. This is just clean from its uh, periostracum. And, um, this is a smaller version of the Cyrinx. This is a, uh, a Tridacna, uh, Tridacna gigas, which is a giant clam. This is one of the two valves of the giant clam. They can get up to 40, 40 plus inches uh, long. They are prized for their meat, their food value in the South Seas, and now are being grown uh, in aquaculture, uh, being grown uh, in the ocean. Uh, and a uh, beautiful animal along the mantle or the inside 
between the two valves uh, it can be vivid blues, greens, reds. Uh, this is the giant clam. This is the family Harpidae or the Harpas or the Harps. The genus is Harpa. And the Harpa look very, very similar. They're uh, from all of the tropical oceans. Uh, most of them, even though they look similar, are very different in a lot of respects, both in coloring, spots, ribs. Uh, the Harpa is unique in the mollusks in that it has a very large muscular foot that when a, another uh, animal or predator touches it, the foot breaks off and then it later regenerates. Uh, these are relatively of, uh, of relatively small value except for three or four different ones. This is one called Harpa Costata. It is very valuable, uh, very hard to find, and is uh, pretty much a collector's item. We have three or four of them here. Another one that is very expensive or very valuable is from Hawaii. It's only discovered in the last 10 years. It's called Harpa Goodwinai. These are examples of the nautilus, the chambered nautilus. There are about five different species of chambered nautilus or argonaut. Uh, these are cephalopods or cephalopods. Uh, it's another group uh, of mollusk. These are closely related to the octopus, the squid, the cuttlefish from the South Seas, tropical South Seas, uh, and uh, are free swimming. So it's uh, very much of a favorite for the tourist trade. Unfortunately, they're getting fished out. Uh, they are a, a beautiful animal. Uh, so these are some examples of a variety of species of argonauts and uh, uh, the uh, rest of the cep cephalopods. The naming of shells uh, is quite an honor. And as uh, we've already talked about, uh, Diminovola sandri was named after Sandra. Uh, to me, that, that was very, very important. But the epitome of recognition and of uh, a, a tremendous climax to having the shell collection and giving it to the Burke Museum is that we have a shell named uh, Pseudosemnia noodlemanni. Uh, it is fully described. It's registered with the ICZN. Uh, and uh, this shell, well, there are very few of these. Uh, this shell was found in the Indian Ocean by Reunion Island. Uh, it was found at 300 meters. Uh, it is a very rare shell. But this is Pseudosemnia noodlemanni. The biggest shell in my collection, if we're talking about a bivalve, would be the giant clam, Tridacna. Uh, the biggest gastropod would be Cyrinx arenus, which is the very large Australian Cyrinx. Uh, it's a golden color. The smallest shell, uh, there, there are shells that are microscopic. Uh, one of the smallest ones is uh, uh, Pseudosimnia noodlemanni which is very small, but keep in mind there are smaller shells than this. The most poisonous, most toxic shell uh, from the standpoint of a harpoon or sting and injecting poison would be a tie between uh, the textile cone uh, and the geographic cone. But definitely cone shells would be the most toxic and most poisonous and probably in the future the most valuable related to the use in medicine. The most um, expensive shells really becomes, again, a, a tie in a lot of ways. From the fossil standpoint, the Gigantocypria uh, gigas uh, in the fossil, very large, very rare, uh, hard to find in any condition. Uh, another one, there are so many that are in the category of highly valuable. This is Cypria leucodon, uh, and it is uh, one of the very valuable shells. As far as the fastest, uh, several shells, uh, several mollusks swim. The chambered nautilus does swim, swims somewhat upside down like this, the animal protruding up this way, and they are quite fast. but 
One that people don't pay a lot of attention to that do swim are the pectins, the scallops. By jet propulsion, they swim rather rapidly. One of the most colorful, in my opinion, and there are so many colorful shells, uh, is uh, Papastyla pulcherima, which is the, the uh, uh, Manus Island tree snail. They're usually green or yellow. Uh, this one happens to be green and yellow. So I consider this to be one of the most colorful in my collection. As far as common shells, when you go shelling and you uh, find shells, these are the ones you find in most abundance. In the tropical waters, this is Janthina. It's purple. There are several species of Janthina. They are pelagic. They don't attach to rocks or the surface or, or the substrate. They float on the surface uh, with a series of little bul uh, uh, little egg cases or uh, and bubbles, and they float onto the shore, and people find them by the hundreds of thousands along the shorelines in tropical waters. Another one, which is relatively common in the Northwest, is uh, is this uh, Murex, Ceratostoma foliatum. Uh, it's common in rocky areas along Puget Sound and uh, other parts of uh, the Northwest Pacific. I guess we had another one that uh, is the most stationary. Uh, stationary in this one means it doesn't move at all. This one embedded itself into coral. This is a spondylus. This is a bivalve that uh, embeds the lower valve right into the coral and opens and shuts the top valve in order to, to uh, breathe and take in water and microorganisms. Well, after over 70 years, 77 years, that means I started when I was one, of collecting shells and enjoying them, um, it really has come to a point now where what are you going to do with these shells? And so I am very pleased that these are going to the Burke Museum. They're going to be uh, either on display at the Burke or will be used for scientific purposes, for research, uh, and for general public education. So very excited about that, and I hope uh, that anyone who sees this uh, gets to see it live, so to speak, at the Burke Museum. But I must unlearn. I'm Julie Stein, and I am the executive director of the Burke Museum. We are a natural history museum, natural history and culture. And we are very excited to have the Noodleman Shell Collection join our 15 million objects that we currently have because of its scientific value and it's just plain beautiful. So the scientific value, I believe, is the fact that uh, the information collected on the shells is both location and time of collection. This allows that shell to be representative of that place in the, on the earth and that place in the ocean at that time. And we know that the oceans are changing pretty quickly. So this is a tremendous uh, scientific value. In addition to that, you have a collection of almost every species for a family, and that is very rare. So we can tell not only what the ocean was like, but a biologist could look at this family and say, I want a representative sample from every species that was part of this family, across time and maybe across geographical areas, but that is really special and we think very valuable. I am very looking forward to having these shells to show in exhibits because shells are aesthetically incredibly pleasing, especially if you mass them in, I hope, some kind of either all the same family or all the same species or all the same location or all the same year. There's so many different ways to do it and engage a visitor to think about what does the ocean below the surface look like. Lastly, I would say, and this is very depressing, but 
there are more and more reports about how our oceans are suffering from acidification. And shells rely on a certain chemistry in the water to uh, extract the calcium carbonate in their shells. And if certain areas of our planet and the oceans in those areas are acidifying, there may be no shells in that area in the future. Because remember, we collect things for 50 years, for 100 years, for 200 years from now. And it's pretty scary and depressing to think about a planet where there wouldn't be shells in these uh, lovely um, tropical locations that we dream of and think of. Uh, but nonetheless, we have an even more important responsibility to put these things in a place where researchers and the public can have access to them because they may not be on this world in another hundred years. So we're extremely excited to have this collection for its breadth, its um, data, its beauty, and I love the fact that you're from here and we are the Washington uh, Natural, we're the Washington State Museum and you've been in Washington State for a long, long time. All my life. All your life. And so right here the Noodleman family will have their legacy in their state museum. And to me that's, I think, um, one of the extra values of our collections and this museum.